Hello everyone. In today's class, we are going to focus on different research approaches. Research approaches help us plan our research study in a structured manner. It often gives the direction for the research project or research work we are engaging in. Before I discuss about different research approaches, it is important to reflect on the steps involved in doing a specific research. This has already been discussed during other components of the class as well as when you were doing your research work. The first step is identification of research area. We can't study everything and everything around the world. So we need to narrow down our research understanding to a smaller component that will help us do our research in a more structured manner. So the first step involves is identification of research area. The next thing is doing basic review of literature and we term it as a priori. A priori helps us what has already been studied in this specific research area we are interested in. Based on a priori, the need for the study can be derived and thereby research questions can be narrowed down. The process of making a good research question has already been discussed in different components. Based on the research question, the methodology can be defined. Methodology helps us understand from where we are going to collect our study. If the data is going to be collected from primary source, the participants can be decided and that can be described better in terms of participant description. If the data is collected from a secondary resource, the sources of secondary data can be defined appropriately. The next step involves the actual data collection. The data collection take place, can take place in qualitative format or quantitative format or even in mixed format. The collected data is further analyzed and the various methods of data analysis will be spoken in a different section. After that, the posterioris are defined. Posterioris are something which helps us understand how the findings are related to existing literature. That will often complete the research. Based on posteriori, a new research can be derived or the, highlight, uh, the findings can itself be used in terms of making this or helping the society. So these are the steps involved in a research. Now let's reflect on different research approaches. In this particular section, we are going to speak about case study method, grounded theory method, ethnographic research, narrative approach, and action research. We have heard about case study method since the time we have studied psychology and we have briefly mentioned about case study method even during our classes. Case study research is uh, often termed it as investigative approach where we are trying to understand a group of people or an individual in an investigative format. In the sense, we are trying to understand the person from a 360 degree perspective. Case study method can help us understand the phenomena or a person in detail and helps us get a deeper understanding. Case study can stem out of various needs, such as a specific phenomena is happening in our society or something which has been observed by a specific group of people and something has been observed uh, about some rare population. A new understanding is needed so those are the times when case study methods can be used. Dominantly, case study method is done on a very restrictive population. Unlike 
quantitative study, we can't generalize to a larger group. For case study, usually a smaller group is or preferably an individual is focused on. A lot of researchers have highlighted that a case study research appears like a microscopic approach. Means in the sense, the people who are part of the case study appears to be under microscope where every aspect of their lifestyle or happening or complete picture is recorded in a structured manner. Often people see this particular thing like peeling of an onion. Like onion have different, different layers. So as in when we are doing research, it can appear like we are peeling the onion and more and more information is derived. Now let's speak about different characteristics of a case study. We can't study everything around the world. Even with so things can happen when we are doing case study. Bounding the case simply means we are setting boundaries on what exactly we intend to study. Even though we aim to have a 360 degree approach, we still need to define what we are exactly studying. So bounding the case simply helps us who we are studying, what we are studying, and how long we will study. So bounding the case simply means creating a boundary or rather say defining what we intend to study. The next thing is purpose of case study. Because case study is done on a restricted population, it often requires a structured reason why we are doing a specific case study, why we are avoiding usage of any other research means. So a good case study needs to have a very good reason why a case study approach has been used. Let us further reflect on different types of case study. You all have an understanding of it, but let, them, let us just now term it. The first one is critical case. The critical case is often seen as a unique population. For example, uh, Felix uh, Gage case can be a critical case. The next thing is extreme or a unique case. Somebody who stands out. For example, uh, there are a lot of people who are twins, but very few are conjoined twins even as an adult. So that is a unique aspect. So if we are trying to understand how the lifestyle of these people are, that is unique case. The next thing is representative case or typical case. Sometimes, for example, you are trying to understand the subjective experience of people with um, schizophrenia. So you're trying to identify one person from the population who is a typical example of somebody who is experiencing schizophrenia and try to do an in-depth understanding. Main concern here is the person who you are selecting for the case study should appear like a typical example for the concern. The next thing is longitudinal study. Certain times when we do case study, we want to understand in depth for a longer duration and that is considered as longitudinal case study. Now let's go to the next thing, which is grounded theory. Grounded theory, the purpose of it was frequently discussed during our classes. When some phenomena which is existing cannot be defined based on existing theory or existing theory stands incomplete, we take the help of grounded theory. I'll repeat myself once again. We take help of grounded theory when existing theory is not able to define the concerns or rather say we are not able to theoretically define the reason for a specific phenomena or the existing theory stands incomplete while defining the existence or the reason for a phenomena. For example, when I'm doing a study on situationship, 
I feel that none of the existing theories are able to define the cause of situationship. Then to understand and derive a new theory or create a new theory, I can use a grounded theory approach. On the other hand, we can also use grounded theory approach when I feel that my study on situationship is not clearly being defined based on existing theories. Suppose I assume that Freudian theory, Eric Erickson's theory, none of it is standing complete to define the reasons for existence of situationship. That's when I go to grounded theory. Grounded theory often involves methods and strategies that shape the data collection. So in short, when we are doing grounded theory, our analysis and data collection method is dominantly going to be shaped based on the approach we are using. Based on the analysis, we are, it is going to help us construct a new theory. And there, that is how we are going to study a specific phenomena. Sometimes in the process of analysis, we are trying to fit in. means in the sense, we are trying to derive to fit in a research idea which we have. Means if I'm trying to build a new theory, I'm trying to fit in the findings of my study to the possible theory I am trying to create. Now, grounded theory methods are particularly helpful for studying individuals, groups, or even social phenomena, even organizational process, where existing theories are standing meaningless or stands incomplete. Grounded theory is often considered as inductive method, mainly because we are deriving a theory or creating a theory or re-understanding a specific phenomena from the by understanding the drawbacks of the existing theories. Now, let's speak about the types of grounded theory. There are just two types of grounded theory. The first one is classical grounded theory and the constructivist grounded theory. When we speak about classical grounded theory, it is based on the approaches of the founders of, uh, or rather say the contributors of grounded theory, where you are analyzing the data to develop a new theory. On the other hand, when we speak about constructivist grounded theory, it helps us understand how subjective experiences are playing a role. So classical grounded theory dominantly in simple possible way, it helps us say that what exactly is happening when we speak about constructivist grounded theory, it speaks about the subjective experiences. So theory derivation and theory understanding for classical grounded theory is dominantly based on what exactly is happening. On the other hand, constructivist grounded theory dominantly focuses on the subjective experiences. So how does a person feel in a specific situation? So that is constructivist grounded theory. <coughs> now let's briefly focus on the steps involved. It is similar to what we have already learned. So we already know that we have to identify a research area. After initial analysis, which is a priori, we are going to define the research question. Based on the research question derivation, we define the methodology and thereby identify who we are going to collect the data from. The data analysis is done and after the data analysis is done, the further coding is created mainly because we are going to create theories out of the 
quotes de derived and you have to redefine us based on the quotes derived after analysis we are going to re refine or rather say change aspects of existing theory or develop a new theory altogether based on the findings once the theory is de uh, derived we are going to validate we are going to check whether the theory actually exists or not through another set of research and then we are going to create a document based on the findings that is the central steps of grounded theory questions might come up regarding elaborate on the steps involved in grounded theory kindly just don't keep the headings make sure you give a specific description with the examples to understand better now let's speak about the ethnographic research ethnographic research is something which is frequently done in psychology which speaks about doing an investigation of a group for a longer period of time means sometimes we when we are doing a qualitative research we just don't do it for a short duration we do it for a longer duration we try to immerse ourselves of and sometimes be even a participant observer we do multiple methods to get the most accurate information about a group so ethnographic research is highly recommended when we are doing culture specific study sometimes even can involve usage of secondary data along with primary data when we are doing ethnographic research because in this process we are trying to immerse ourselves to understand the existence of a phenomena ethnographic approach employs multiple methodologies so in short we don't follow a single methodological structures so methodology frequently changes based on what we intend to study and we are going to keep doing the research till a theoretical explanation is derived about the reasons of, of a specific phenomena happening for a group or a culture so in short we will keep modifying our methodology or changing the methodology till a theoretical understanding is derived from a specific population now let's briefly speak about the steps it is similar to what is the normal steps involved in a research but there is a slight modification uh, for others the methodology remains constant but here the methodology frequently keeps changing so sometimes we may use a quantitative approach after deriving the data we have a, another new research where we are trying to understand in terms of qualitative approach then we try to understand all together a study based on secondary data so this particular research method is highly recommended when we are trying to understand a specific culture at large and dominantly for a longer duration the next thing is narrative inquiry narrative inquiry is frequently used in psychology as well as in other subjects such as in english narrative inquiry is a study of experience as a story we all love narrating stories but stories how we narrate it and how we uh, speak about it speaks a lot about how we are thinking and experiencing the world around so narrative inquiry is a method which it, which is dominantly stemming or prominently trying to understand the happenings based on the type of stories we make qualitative research generally uses narratives mainly because it involves verbal acts that someone is telling to another person in a way that a situation has occurred so in short it kinds of verbalizes a subjective phenomena when we speak about narrative inquiry we often just don't 
refer to verbal information verbal we also focus on written text so sometimes when we are trying to understand how people create stories we can do it based on autobiographies interviews and so on sometimes the narrative approaches can even be done on field notes in the sense when we are interacting how a person is narrating the story uh, like uh, communicating that also sometimes can be structurally recorded in terms of understanding it in a better manner a lot of researchers often consider narrative approaches transactional experience in the sense it's an exchange of ideas transaction uh, involves you telling the other person responding and it goes on so a lot of research often consider narrative approach as a transactional experience mainly because it reflects how a person shares relationship with people around or places and also helps the researcher develop ideas and understand the existence at a whole usually narrative inquiry is done when we are trying to understand the psychological sub, uh, experiences of a particular person so yeah that is about narrative approach the steps involves is similar to what we already know the different reasons uh, or different spaces where narrative approach can be the best suited one as a research methodology when we are trying to understand a specific person after their death probably we have written an autobiography and we are trying to understand how their lifestyle went for example uh, if we look at if somebody can do a narrative analysis of uh, autobiography of uh, abdul kalam which is uh, wings of fire although it was written by somebody else but it still denotes a autobiography so that is one such example you can write any of the examples questions can come up about different methods or different steps involved in narrative approaches you can write the different steps which are generally there however highlight the uniqueness of narrative approach when you are describing it then comes methods of data collection in narrative inquiry there are very various methods of collecting data the first one is using interviews then is qualitative sub surveys in the sense we have structured set of questions and we expect participants to answer them in an elaborate manner recordings of history in the sense documents uh in form of libraries can be used another interesting aspect of collecting data in narrative inquiry is focus group discussions where as a group or a community is called in or members of the community is called in to describe for example when you are trying to understand how did people see an accident so you call everybody who saw the accident and ask people how did the car approach how did the person react and so on so narrative inquiry is mainly a study of how people make stories the last aspect here is action research action research is one of the best research approach mainly because of its applicability the main aspect of action research is supporting change it is said to be a flexible me research methodology which aims in bringing in a change in action research you just don't do a research for the sake of it you do a research to bring about a change for example you have realized that in uh, you are doing a research on quality of food in college canteen you're just not doing a in, uh, if you are doing an action research you're trying to bring in a change through a research this makes it unique mainly because it has a very strong applicable change it integrates social research with exploratory actions to promote development so because it is very applicable by nature which aims to bring in a solution this promotes the aspect of development 
Action research, as previously mentioned, is flexible by nature. Sometimes overlapping investigation cycles. Sometimes you'll be investigating uh, based on the example which I just gave. You may be exploring the quality of food. Sometimes you may explore uh, the interest level of st students. Sometimes the interest level of employees who are working and so on. So there can be an overlapping ideas as and main thing here is the fluid nature of research in action research. It is not very rigid. The main goal of action research is not to make it very rigid, but make it flexible. However, the central idea here is to bring in a change. Action research is both practical and theoretical in the sense you use theory to derive uh, to say that a problem is happening because of this. This is a possible solution. So suppose you realize through theories that children or uh, college students don't like uh, same quality food every day, same tasting food every day. That's what theoretically it says. So in terms of practical knowledge, you uh, you can also say that you're trying to bring uh, say that bring in variety of foods on a daily basis so that people are more interested to eat food in the canteen. The steps involved in action research can appear to be different from others, mainly because of its applicable nature. So the first step here is investigating a current situation in partnership with planning for a change. So still you're not just doing a research you are doing a research with a in your back. You should always keep in mind that you are doing a research to identify a problem and trying to find a possible solution to the problem. The next step is introducing changes, trying out new practices with the aim of improvement. So in this here, it speaks about theoretical application where you have observed that in uh, and theories have said that. Uh, College students prefer variety. College students uh, prefer more appetizing food at a lower cost. So this is what the theories and existing literatures have said. So you are trying to say to uh, canteen owners that bring in more variety and bring in a reasonable cost associated food. Step three is monitoring whether your intervention is applicable or not. So you have said that change the cost of the food and bring in more variety. So this is your intervention. So then you, in step three, you're checking whether your intervention is effective or not by again collecting data based on your intervention, whether your intervention is effective or not. Step four is very important where you're analyzing and interpreting the data to generate an actionable knowledge. So in the sense, if the findings were effective in the sense, uh, your re intervention that, uh, if the cost is reduced and the variety is added, are more people going to the canteen or not? So you are seeing whether your intervention is effective. If it is effective, it is adding on to the knowledge system or thereby or else again, we'll go back to step one. So that is all for today's class. When we speak about exam, uh, from exam point of view, try to understand that the answers are expected to be descriptive. You can't have a short answer. The pointers are mentioned here. Try to elaborate it based on your subjective understanding. You will fetch better marks if you give examples. Uh, I have already sent certain sample questions. Make sure you refer that for your preparation for your exam. That's it from my side. For any further clarification, feel free to message me or call me. The you can take the number from your classroom. Thank you and have a nice day.